And hello once again, and welcome to Wednesday night here at Calvary Chapel Heartland, where we're uh, going to go through the book of Exodus again tonight here at the Word on Wednesdays. Um, what a, just another beautiful day and a privilege to be here. Um, let's go to the Lord and, uh, and ask Him to join us. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for, uh, Lord, for your word and for tonight and for the opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters and to study and to learn. And so I just pray you join us here tonight, Lord, that you fill us with your spirit. You give us wisdom and understanding, Lord, into uh, this, this book that we are studying and reading through. Father, we just thank you that we have your word your word written by your hands, Lord, and I just, Lord, what a blessing. And so I just ask you uh, to join us right now in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you've been with us before, you know that we, we're here in the book of Exodus. We just finished chapter 33 last week. And so um, what we saw last week was after the whole incident with the people, um, building an idol, the golden calf, and, and, and doing all that stuff, and, and God getting angry with the people, and Moses coming off the mountain and confronting the people, that Moses now went back and started meeting with God in, in his tent uh, out of the camp, um, away from the, the camp, and, and trying to restore that relationship or to um, really to build that relationship with God so that God would remain with the people himself and not just an angel, right? And so um, Moses pleaded with God, and we saw that, and, and it was based on God's grace. Moses said, if I found grace in your, uh, then, then Lord, remain with us, remain with the people. And that's what we saw, that, that revival of that re relationship. And God answered Moses, and God affirmed that he would go with them, and, and he even showed Moses his glory. His glory to affirm the relationship, right? As he, as he passed by, remember he hid Moses in the cleft of the rock. He hit him with his hand and he, he passed by and then he let Moses see his glory as he passed by. So this week, because of that restored relationship now with the people, we're going to take that the next step and God's going to actually restore the broken tablets He's going to write on some new tablets, and they're going to renew the covenant. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight as we study chapter 34. And so let's begin that here in Exodus chapter 34. We'll begin uh, at verse 1, where uh, God's word reads, And the Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke which you broke. Remember, Moses threw them down. Verse 2, So be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you, and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and then Moses rose early in the morning, and he went up Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and he took in his hand, the two tablets of stones. So remember, Moses had actually broke the first tablets, right? When he came down off the mountain, he confronted the people. He saw what the people were doing. It angered even Moses. God was angered. Moses was angered. They had really broken the covenant they had just made with the Lord just uh, less than two months earlier. And, and Moses threw the, threw the tablets down. Breaking the covenant, right? But here God wants to restore them. They're going to restore them. And God says, I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets. God says, I will rewrite it. I'll do it again. Because Moses had interceded. And Moses had repented. And Israel had repented. Remember, they had mourned. And so here it was time and appropriate now to give them new stones, new tablets. And he says, it's just like the first time when Moses goes up on the mountain. He says, you come on up on the mountain, Moses, but let no other man come up with you. Right? No flocks, no herds, no animals feeding, nobody. Just you, Moses. 
And that, 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 remember the first time Moses went up, it was just after God had given to all the people the Ten Commandments verbally, and then he said, Moses, you come up here now, and he told all the people, you don't come near the mountain, right? And so, just like that time, this second time, they're told to stay away. Moses, again, is going to be that liaison between God and the people, the mediator between God and the people. You see, the people, they couldn't deal with God directly because of their own sin, because of their rebellion. And so Moses bridges that gap. And God meets him there. Look at verse 5. And now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him. So again, we see the cloud. We see God in the form of the cloud. The cloud mentioned, no, no doubt, the, the cloud of glory known as the Shekinah. Right? The cloud is mentioned so many times in the Bible. It's mentioned even previously in Exodus multiple times. It covered Mount Sinai. It went with Israel by day, leading them. It stood at the tent of Moses when he met in the tent in the very last chapter. We see in Chronicles it filled Solomon's temple with glory. We see in Second Chronicles, or in Luke, it overshadowed Mary at the conception of Jesus. Again in Luke, it was present at the transfiguration of Jesus. And in Revelation, we see it will be present at the return of Jesus. And so now it stands. He stands there with God. It says he stood with him there. It's the way God appeared to Moses <coughs> there at Mount Sinai. And I think it's the, the very thing Moses asked for in the previous chapter. He just wanted to be close with him. And Moses said, please show me your glory. He's there with him again in his glory. And it proclaimed the name of the Lord. It means that God revealed his character to Moses. Remember, the character is in the name. That's all that means is God revealed his character to Moses right there. And Moses experiences the character of the Lord as the Lord passed before him. Again, a reference to the last chapter where the Lord passed before him. He experienced what God said he would. Verse 6, he continues and he says, And proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So God passed before him and God proclaimed. God, Moses saw and his revealed character, right? And Moses, by his words, he says he proclaimed it to Moses and it happened. Uh, undoubtedly, the, this whole event just had a powerful spiritual experience for Moses, right? There, there had to be a lot of rich feelings and emotions going on. But you see, God is not, he didn't do it to, to, to cause emotions and feelings, or not only that, but really to connect to the whole person, right? And, and what was it he proclaimed? The Lord, the Lord God, his name, Yahweh. It was the same name for God that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob knew, Yahweh. It, was, it wasn't a new revelation of God. It was God presenting himself as the eternal, the immutable God. It, it expresses that the name Yahweh expresses all that he is, all that he does. All his saving acts. It's God's self-revelation. And he's revealing himself to Moses in this powerful way. And knowing that God, knowing God, just, just merely knowing God should be an active interest of every human being. I mean, we look around and we see this creation, we see the world. 
That should drive us to want to know the Creator, to want to know Him in a personal way, especially for Christians. Spurgeon put it this way, it said, It has been said by someone that the proper study of mankind is man. I will not oppose the idea, but I believe it is equally true that the proper study of God's elect is God. The proper study of a Christian is the Godhead. The highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of the great God whom he calls his Father. You see, it all starts with the name. It all starts with that longing to know to the proper study of God is the study of God himself, the Godhead. And so he starts it right here with the name Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, repeated, emphasizing who he is. And then he says, merciful and gracious, merciful. It's better translated, full of compassion. You see, God is full of compassion. Five of the 13 times that that word is used, it's translated full of compassion in the New King James. And it's the same word that's used regarding Israel in, in, uh, in the Exodus when, they, when it's referred to in the Psalms. In Psalm 78, he says, But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many t a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. You see, it was his compassion in action. And that's what we see in this verse, full of compassion, his mercy, merciful and gracious. Gracious is the idea to bend or to stoop in kindness to an inferior, or to, to favor or to bestow, right? It's, it's grace given to the undeserving. And, and we're all undeserving. The world don't like that today. The world don't like that word, gracious. Why on earth would you be gracious? Would you, would you be give something to someone that's so undeserving? You know? The world looks at everything completely opposite. It's a more selfish. He doesn't deserve that. I'm certainly not going to give him that. That would be a waste. But God doesn't see it that way. Oh, but for the grace, the grace of God, right? It's the free gift, that free gift of love that we get from God. And then he goes on, the long-suffering and abounding in goodness and abounding in truth, right? God is slow to anger. That's what long-suffering means, slow to anger. He doesn't have a short fuse. He doesn't, he's not impatient with us. He's very patient with us. And he was patient with these guys at the time, too, um, and we all know what it's like to deal with somebody that has a short fuse, right? Um, it's not fun sometimes. People that get offended or outraged over the slightest little offense, over the, the smallest of things, right? Any kind of perceived wrong. But see, God isn't like that. He's long-suffering. And He's abounding, full of goodness and truth. Abounding means a never-ending supply. It means... You, he, he'll never run out of goodness and truth. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. You see, God shows His goodness toward us through His forgiving nature. It's through that grace because we are forgiven. Many people think God, you know, they, I don't know, they, they worship, they look at these gods that are, there's just no way they would ever forgive. They think that some types of sin are just unforgivable. But God, nothing, nothing God cannot forgive. The revelation of God's character to Moses right here just puts away any idea that we have that God is a God, a bad God of the Old Testament, right? It's all wrapped up in His goodness. And we talked about that last week at the end of the last chapter. It's all about His goodness, and it's all His characters wrapped up in His goodness, which is represented by His name. 
in the name of Yahweh. Character of love, mercy, grace. And it's all present right here in the Old Testament and the New Testament. You see, we read all about it in the New Testament, but it's right here in the Old Testament as well. And Psalm 86 repeats this same revelation of God. It says, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. God says, This by no means clears the guilty. You see, we're all still guilty. His love and His forgiveness do not clear the guilty. God will punish and that punishment will have repercussions for generations. And it'll have repercussions right here for the Israelites in this, in this instance for generations to come. The generations that hate him. We see that a few chapters back when we were in chapter 20. It says the repercussions will be for genera- the generations that hate him. You see, the, only, the, the, people, the people that turn their back, that walk away from God... They will suffer. But because of the work of Jesus Christ today in the New Testament, the righteousness of God is satisfied. The grace and the mercy are righteously given to all Christians. Isn't that a beautiful thing? So God reveals himself to Moses again up on the mountain. And so how does Moses respond to this revelation? Look at verse 8. And so Moses made haste. And he bowed his head toward the earth and he worshiped. And then he said, if now I have found grace in your sight. He's repeating what he said last, what, last chapter, last week, when he was, he was asking uh, for God to be with them. Now, if now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your inheritance. You see, Moses, he still remembers. He's just pleaded with God before, before God decided to bring him back up on the mountain in the end of last chapter. If if your grace, Lord, if I have found grace in your sight, then then he he calls him my Lord. I pray, go among us, right? And he reminds him, he he recognizes. Moses confesses and recognizes we are stiff-necked people. But because of your grace. And so this first primary reaction of Moses up on the mountain when God reveals himself again through his name is, is, is simply to worship. Worship God. Fall before God and just worship him. And when we know who God is and all his great love for us, that's the most practical thing we can do. Is worship him. And worship him more than ever. You see, it's those characters of God's that are striking and, and speaking about grace and truth. And the effect that it had on Moses was just adoration and prayer. And it should be the same for us. He made haste. He didn't waste any time to start to worship God. It compelled him to worship. Do you have a compelling drive today to worship God? Because of what he has done for you. Moses started his prayer. Now if I have found grace in your sight. Just as before. He asked for his goodness. His grace and his mercy. And he asked not only for himself. But it be extended to the nation. He prayed for his fellow brothers and sisters. And for the nation. He knew he didn't deserve it, and he knew they didn't deserve it. But he says, if I have found grace, and he knew why they didn't deserve it. He even reminds God, yeah, they're stiff-necked people. Actually, he says, we are stiff-necked people. Wow. Wow. But you see, when we see the goodness of God for what it is, we shouldn't hesitate to ask. Ask. Ask that that goodness be extended to us. And we have that because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We have the right, the privilege to come to him 
and to ask, to meet with him as Moses did because of Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, I pray that you do, would come to know him. So Moses, he even takes it a step further right here, going beyond just asking for these things for himself, right? He asks on behalf of the nation. And what does God say? God says the covenant needs to be renewed. Look at verse 10. And he said, Behold, he being God, God said, Behold, I make a covenant. Before all your people I will do marvels, such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I am driving out from before you the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. God says, God will make a covenant. You see, it was God's covenant. Israel's invited to join with him in the covenant. There's no negotiated terms with Israel. It's all God's terms. God will dictate the terms to the people through is of Israel through Moses. But he says, I will do marvels, right? His plan was to glorify himself to all the nations, all the people through Israel. Israel would be his people and Israel would help reveal him to all the nations and to all the other people to show his glory and the great things that he would do through them and among them. And Israel had a choice. Either the great things would be blessings, so impressive that every nation would know that God alone had blessed Israel, Or the great things would be curses. So horrible that every nation would know that God had chastised Israel and yet kept them a nation. You see, we see some of the blessings through Solomon. We see some of the curses through the exile. It goes both ways. One way or the other, though, the other nations are going to recognize that there's a God, the God of Israel, and there is people. And God will glorify himself through them to all the nations. For their own good, it was essential, though, that they obey God. Notice what he told them there. He says, observe what I command you this day. That's all that was required of them was to obey his law. And they could enjoy the blessings of the covenant of obedience. And he will do marvels throughout their history. And he does do marvels all throughout their history. Like putting them in possession of the land to begin with, of Canaan. Using the walls of Jericho. Causing the walls of Jericho to fall down. Making the sun and the moon stand still. We could go on and on of the many, many marvels that he does throughout their history. And some of them blessed the nation, and some of them did not. But he starts by the promised land, by driving out. You see, Israel could not do it by themselves. They would need God to drive out the nations of Canaan, and that's what he promises. And we'll see that later on when they eventually do take the land. But the point is that Israel must be different. Israel must be different, and they must obey. Look at verse 12. He says, Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. But you shall destroy their altars, and break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods. And one of them invites you, and you eat of his sacrifice. And you take of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters play the harlot with their gods. Excuse me. And you make your sons play the harlot with their gods. 
basically what we see here, and, and it was previously stated in, in back in chapter 23, is the culture of the Canaanites was so corrupt. It was really beyond redemption. And, and God is warning them. God is saying, do not get entrapped and ensnared into their lifestyle. You see, you are to be separate. You are to be different than the world and then these Canaanites. And he doesn't want them to get caught up in any of these sinful practices of the culture of the Canaanites, right? And we just saw a couple of weeks ago what happens when they worship anything other than God himself with the whole incident with the golden calf. And there was a danger here. There's going to be a danger. When they eventually come into the land, if they get sucked up into the, into the world of the Canaanites, right? There's going to be a danger of associating too closely with these people. And start worshiping their gods. It says that they play the harlot with their gods. There's a definite connection here between the worship of the Canaanite gods and sexual immorality. Many of the Canaanite gods were fertility gods, or, or, and they would, they were worshipped with these ritual uh, events that included prostitutes and sex and all of these things that was considered worship. And and the Israelites have to renounce this whole thing and anything to do with any other gods and idolatry. Verse seventeen tells them, you shall make no molded gods for yourself. That's interesting because we've just come through an event where they did that very thing. And God's reminding them now, reminding Moses, he says, you shall make no molded gods. Do not do what you just did. It's a repetition of a command from back in chapter 20, right? It's the second commandment of the Ten Commandments. And it's especially meaningful right now because they just did it in light of what they did a couple of chapters ago with the golden calf. And so God reminds them once again, don't fall into this trap. And then he reminds them of the Feast of Unleavened Bread that they're to keep. Remember the Feast of Unleavened Bread the, the, the represented the removing of the sin from the home? Look at verse 18. The feast of unleavened bread you shall keep. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread as I commanded you in the appointed time of the month of Abib. For in the month of Abib you came out from Egypt. This was first mentioned all the way back in chapter 12 when we, we have the Exodus, right? And it's just, it's, it speaks of the purity that God wants in our homes and in our lives. The removing of the leaven, the removing of the yeast from the home. You see, all leaven, it was a symbol of sin, and it was to be put away, taken out for a whole week. It was a, represented them walking symbolically in purity. And what did it mean to be pure and to belong to God? And, and God's reminding them now in this, in this dialogue with Moses that when he's telling them, you're going to take the people into the promised land, but don't get hooked up with the Canaanites, don't fall into their worship of their gods, right? And remember the unleavened bread. Remember to remain pure, to clean out the leaven. Here's what it means to be separated from other nations and to belong to God. Verse 19, All that open the womb are mine, and every male firstborn among your livestock, whether ox or sheep, but the firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem him, then you shall break his neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem. And none shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. And you shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of vin gathering at the year's end. Three times in the year all your men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. For I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, nor shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left till morning. 
the first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. So God reminds them what it means to be separated from the other people and to be his. He repeats basically the law, some of the law, that he had given Moses on the mountain before. Starting with all that opened the womb are mine. Right? He's repeating the laws regarding the firstborn and their dedication to him. All the way back from chapter 13 and chapter 22. And he says, all shall be redeemed. All shall be redeemed. None shall appear before me empty handed. And, and in the context of their work, they are to be working for God. Six days work. Then observe the Sabbath and the festivals, all the festivals they are to observe, the three in particular. It's all to be in honor of Him and for Him. Everything we do should be for God, to honor Him. Three times a year, Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, each Israelite man had to gather before the Lord. And if they had been obedient, if they were obedient, He promised His supernatural protection to them, right? The power and the providence of God. How easy would it have been for all the surrounding nations to just completely wipe Israel out many, many times in history and just take them over. But God protected them. And here, once again, he reminds them about the leaven. You shall not offer my blood of my the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. Do not let the blood be contaminated with the sin. God wants our first, He wants our best, and He wants us to do it all for Him. The first fruits, bring them into the house. When you go into the land, I want the first fruits of your work, of your labor. Everyone should be redeemed. Everything and everyone belongs to Him. That was the covenant. And then finally, he finishes off that section with not boiling a young goat with its mother's milk. Kind of a strange idea, but it was very appropriate for the time. It's a command that was repeated from chapter 23. And, and it really has to do with this pagan fertility rituals that were going on in the Canaanites, with the Canaanites in the land. And, and God is reminding them, don't, do not get caught up in their rituals. Later on, this is the very command that gets taken out of context, I think, by the, by the Jewish people. And even to this day, that's why the Jewish people won't mix meat and dairy. But God's just reminding Moses of the law that he had given him before. He's rewriting them on the tablets again for him to bring down a second time we see them put in writing the second time. Verse 27, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So he wrote the covenant and the commandments, and he wrote the law back on the, on the tablets. And He's there another 40 days and 40 nights. Remember, he was there 40 days and 40 nights the first time. But it's reestablished in the covenant with the people. And his covenant was based on these words and other words. And it's important for Moses to write them down. And, and we're glad he wrote them down because now we have them. It was important that they not just be left to memory, Right? Interesting, this 40 days and 40 nights, this time it's without food or drink. 
I'm gonna tell you right now, 40 days, that's, that's definitely almost impossible. You, you're very unique and supernatural to have a fast for that long. It's possible, but it's remarkable to live without food for 40 days. It's definitely a miracle to go without water for 40 days. The human body can't go that long without water. And this kind of fasting was never repeated anywhere in the, or, or even recommended anywhere in the scriptures. You see, it's because Moses was being by, sustained by God himself. It reminds me of the verse in Matthew and in Deuteronomy where it says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, Moses was being sustained by God's speaking to him. 40 days. Wow. God sustained him. And he still had the strength to get up and carry the tablets down the mountain. That's amazing to me. And he wrote everything on the tablets and he brought them down and these tablets will eventually be placed into the Ark of the Covenant. We'll see that in Deuteronomy. And this whole encounter certainly had to have a, a, a major impact on Moses. And we know it had an impact on Moses because when he came down, his face was different. His face shines. Look at verse 29. And now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And so when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. Moses didn't even know it. He was just so, I think, taken by the whole encounter that he didn't even realize his own face was shining the way it was. But it was shining in a way that uh, it certainly stood out to all the other people. You see, it was that close communion with God that had physically affected Moses. You would think that after 40 days and 40 nights of not eating and drinking, he would have been a shell of a man. He would have been pale at best. He would have looked sickly, but he didn't. He had a glow. He had a shine about him because of his encounter with God. And it, it, it shined, this, this glow, it was so much that it made every one of us afraid to even come near him. Right? This radiance, this radiant glow. A peace, a joy, a love, all of that you could, I could imagine you could see in his face. And that should be evident in all of us who believe in Jesus Christ, who, who have that close personal relationship with our Lord every day. We should have that, maybe not the same glow Moses had here, but there should be something in our face that, sh that, sh that shows people that we love God and we love Jesus. And I think this, this here, though, with Moses even goes beyond that principle. And, um, and he himself was even unaware of his own spiritual radiance. And he was a humble man. And it was because of that, when he found out, he, he humbled himself. And how do we know he was a humble man? Numbers chapter 12, verse 3 says, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. So he had humility. He was a humble man. He didn't come down gloating. That's not what the shine was. He didn't come down raving about his personal relationship with God. He had a glow of God on him. There's only two men in the Bible whose faces shone like this, Moses and Stephen in chapter 6 of Acts. And both were humble men. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, I'm afraid, brethren, that God could not afford to make our, our faces shine. We should grow too proud. It needs a very meek and lowly spirit to bear the shinings of God. 
I think I resemble that remark probably. I probably would. If I saw my face shining like that in the mirror after an encounter with God, I'm, I probably would get too proud. Spurgeon would go on to say, We are always praying, Lord, make my face shine. But Moses never had such a wish, and therefore when it did shine, he did not know it. He had not laid his plans for such an honor. Let us not set traps for personal reputation or even glance a thought that way. In other words, why even pray to God, make my face shine? That's just, Moses didn't ask for it. It just happened. Oh, to be humble, right? Humble. Anyway, Moses, he comes down and he relays and relates the covenant of God to the leaders in Israel. Look at verse 31. And then Moses called to them and Aaron and to all the rulers of the congregation that returned to him and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. So first off, all of them had retreated and gone away from Moses because of the radiance of his face, right? He persuaded them to come back. And then all the, the, the leaders and then the children of Israel. And he gave them all of the, what the Lord had told him. You know, he, he, he re relayed the commandments. Everything that, that God had spoken to him. Yet as he, again, it was because of this transforming communion with God that he had. But I find it interesting that he doesn't just have this great thing with God. He doesn't just come down and give it to the leaders and walk away. He gets directly involved with the work, with all the people with governing, with leading, with being that mediator between God and the people. He acted, in other words. He acted on what God had revealed to him and what God had done with him and through him. And I think sometimes we have these wonderful moments with God and then we revel in that and we walk away from that. But I don't think we always act on it. And so... I pray that we would. And Moses now has to lead the people. Just as the Lord is leading him. Look at verse 33. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and he'd speak to the children of Israel whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. So Moses, in his humility, he would cover his face before the people. In the presence of God, presumably in his own tent still at this point, he would take the veil off. Yet when he would come out and speak with the people, he'd put the veil on. I think it, it, it's probably, it's, it's easy for us to, to think that he probably wore it so they wouldn't be afraid of him like they were when he first came down. Or maybe it was to protect others from that radiance. Yet the Apostle Paul would explain later that the real purpose of the veil was not to hide the shining face of Moses, but to, to, so that the diminishing glory of his face would not be observed. He says in 2 Corinthians, Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. You see, the old covenant was going to pass away. It had glory, it, but it was a fading glory. There's a new covenant coming. And I think that Moses, according to Paul here, the, the, the shine on his face, it was slowly fading away with time. And they, God didn't want the people to see the fading glory of the old covenant, right? 
they might have lost confidence in Moses. Well, maybe he's not speaking with God anymore. Look, his face isn't shining as much as it used to, right? Because we always want to, we compare everything. Oh, that's different than it was yesterday. This is different than it was the day before. And then we start drawing conclusions and, and doing all kinds of things that, What did it really mean when he said his face shone? The Hebrew word for shone here literally means it shot forth beams. There's actually a related Hebrew noun for horn. Um, the Latin Vulgate kind of mistranslates this verb as having horns. And, and so you'll see a lot of medieval works of art and stuff that'll show Moses with horns. Um, I, I don't believe in that, but it just beams. He's, he's shine. He's shown. But it's, it fades over time because the old covenant is going to fade away. There's going to be a new covenant coming, and it's going to be a glorious, glorious light like the world has never seen. And his name is Jesus Christ. And that's that's the glory, the, the face that shines that we need to look to. And I pray that you know him today. We're going to stop here tonight. Next week when we pick back up in chapter 35, Moses again is going to be giving more of the instructions that came from God to the people. And we'll start seeing some of the details for the people and how they're to continue to worship and serve God. But for now, I just want us to think about our relationship with Christ, our humility. What an example Moses sets for the people through this encounter with God. I pray that you've had an encounter with Jesus Christ. If you haven't, He's waiting. All you have to do is ask. So until next week, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for your word again. What a blessing it is to come together, to be able to study, to fellowship, to absorb what it is you would have us to learn from your word. The example set by the Israelites themselves, by God, by yourself and by your servant Moses. What a privilege uh, it is to be able to study these things so that we too might know your true nature. And so I just thank you for that. I pray that as we go forth this week, you would walk before us, that you would direct our paths. Father, draw us to you, ever closer to you in that relationship with you every day. So I ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.